Well, welcome everybody uh, to today's webinar. Uh, we are very excited to host today's um, webinar in machine learning. This is the third year in a row we are doing the A to Z data science webinar series. This is to showcase it to new students uh, where their career in data science and AI can take them. Uh, today's event is in partnership with Sava and Storm, um, two student associations at the University of Amsterdam, and um, super excited to work together with them. Today we'll be touching on the subject of machine learning, um, and I will give you a small introduction of what we do at Amsterdam Data Science, and then um, I will introduce you to our first speaker today. So, I will give you a small introduction. Um, at Amsterdam Data Science, uh, what we do. So, we are established in 2014. ADS is an initiative of the four knowledge institutes, uh, CVE, Havia, FU and UFA. ADS is a network organization of academic and industrial partners that has established a strong data science and AI ecosystem in Amsterdam. Amsterdam Data Science exists to facilitate the growth and international standing of this ecosystem. It does this by connecting knowledge institutes, bringing academia, industry and society together by providing a platform for collaboration and engagement. So that's kind of what we do at Amsterdam Data Science. Um, then I would love you to love to introduce you to our first speaker, Naz Levant. Thank you. So thank you for joining today. I will walk you through a project that we have delivered to Formula One um, in 2019 on AWS Insights. And I will mainly focus on the um, battle forecast project that we have done for them. Uh, before I get into the whole project, I would like to show you a video so that um, you can see how the final output looks like. Basically, when you watch that video, it seems like you're watching a very fun race that is quite interesting. So many things that are happening. There are battles between two cars and there are, uh, there are pit stops happening and there are some pit stop strategy going in the race. That's actually what is uh, what makes Formula One exciting. In reality, this is basically what a a fun race looks like. And if you look at it, it's just some raw footage where 20 cars are just driving on driving in circles, which what we call laps, and it's actually not so easy to get stories out of. So it's basically the director's job to really make sense of what is going on during the race given that there are so many footage that is coming in so many data that is coming in from the sensors that are placed from the track where there is editing and graphics getting in place during the live race and as, as you know it's a quite quite fast race and you need to be able to keep track of stories what's going to be interesting for the audience and fans so that you can make sure that you place them on the right time to the screen and make it exciting for the fans and audience basically so the director takes all of that raw footage and turns it into stories which is the attention grabbing part of formula one and what and the data f1 collected over time and the amount of personnel that they hired you can see the comparison over here so throughout the years they increased their personnel count of course but uh, they cannot scale as the data 
grows and data increases. And there is so much information gathered within the data. So we decided to collaborate and come up with AWS Insights, where today I'm going to be focusing on the pit stop strategy and battle forecast, where we predicted the probability of an overtake happening either via the pit stop or during the race via battle forecast to see if a battle is going to happen which means two cars are going to be within what within less than one second distance from each other and if that's going to happen how difficult it is going to be for the um, drivers within that battle. So here you see some of our projects that we delivered. Um, so we'll focus on the overtake probability and some part of a talk, I will talk about the pit stop advantage. So what happens when a driver pits, whether if that's going to be an advantage, whether if he's going to come ahead or he is going to be behind by the driver behind. So I will skip the videos as you might have a glitch, but in the end of the call, I will leave you with a video link so that you can watch it on your own time when it comes to better forecasts. So in this project, our, our objective was to predict the time delta within milliseconds between two cars. And as you know, there are 20 cars in a Formula One race, so we had to predict the difference between each car that is following the other. And we also calculated what is the likelihood of an overtake, given that historically within the same track, uh, many overtakes happen. Uh, we can predict within different locations within the track how difficult it was to overtake the driver ahead, because not all tracks are created equally. There are many different countries that these races are happening and the tracks look quite different. The turns are significantly different. So how difficult it is going to be given that I am now in battling distance with the driver ahead. And also provides, we had to provide all of these results within milliseconds latency because the event is happening live. The cars are very fast and seconds are very important in an F1 race. And if you're late to give the prediction, then your story is not even relevant anymore. And I will walk you through how we created an autonomous application that requires as little main labor as possible. So utilizing AWS, these were the building blocks of our solution. So we had Amazon API Gateway, which enables us to expose an endpoint to capture incoming race data and trigger our application. So basically, this is the data coming in from these sensors within the track, and these sensors might be in anywhere in the world where an F1 race is happening. Secondly, we utilize AWS Lambda, which is a serverless scalable tool which enables you to host your applications. And here we implemented the application race logic and the predictions criteria. So basically, when two cars are going to be in battle, which story we should share with the director so that he can pay attention to it. Because there are so many stories happening. Many cars will be getting closer to each other, but which one of them are going to be at battle? And when the director should pay attention to it so they can put that in screen. That's, uh, so this is where the AWS Lambda comes in place. Amazon SageMaker uh, is the third tool, which as data scientists we use a lot in our daily works. And it enables us to build AI ML models and scale our solutions uh, throughout different instance types, which means you can use any kind of uh, compute and memory power to run your models and automatically hyper tune your hyperparameters and improve your predictions, basically. So this is where we did all of our experiments, making sure which we know which model to use. We have tested how little inference time that we are going to have and whether if our models is going to be meeting that criteria, what is the performance like? Are we able to predict uh, the battles correctly? And there are so many outliers happening during an F1 race. If it rains, 
Uh, the race changes significantly. If a car spins, then there are safety cars on the track and that changes the whole story. So all of those outlier removals, predictive modeling happens in Amazon SageMaker. And then there is the fourth tool, which is Amazon DynamoDB. And it is basically a key value pair database provider that uh, enables you to run millisecond latency when it comes to retrieving data. So it's great that we have these predictions, but how are we going to retrieve them and share them very quickly? So there we utilize Amazon DynamoDB. And I will show you the final architecture so that you can see how everything connects to each other. And then finally, we have S3, which is a persistent and durable data storage tool that we have, which enables us to store everything that is related to um, model training results, the training data, model artifacts, and so on. So how does it look like when we put it all together? Basically, um, there is the broadcast center that is right next to the track where the uh, F1 race is happening. And that data should be sending information to the worldwide international feed so all of the fans can watch the race live. However, the headquarters of F1 is in Beacon Hill, which is where we pull all of the data from. So, and also, for example, when a race happens in Sydney, then it takes quite some time for that data to get into the uh, Beacon Hill office, and then we have to pull that information as quick as possible so that we can come up with predictions on when a battle, for, battle is going to happen. So when we pull this data, it goes through an API gateway, which sends data to Lambda, where all of the executions happen, like um, like the training of, like the predictions of the model, the business logic around it, what is a battle, what is virtue of sharing, and then outputting the results to DynamoDB and also to S3 to save all of the modeling results. And then we also have Amazon SageMaker, where we utilize uh, our experiments and training information and modeling information as well. Everything that is happening is being logged. So I didn't talk about CloudWatch, but basically it enables us to log all of the information. So let's say from now on, you can always go back and then check the results of what happened during that race. So what were the takeaways of doing this project? For us, it was quite important to work backwards from the customer requirements. So all of the things that you see in this architecture was designed to serve Formula One needs, given that they needed very little latency time, they needed accurate predictions, but still very fast. So for example, most of the deep learning modeling approaches were out of the window when it comes to forecasting. And um, aside from that, all of the tools were picked uh, by their sub-second la sub latency capabilities and so on. It, the second KPI was uh, setting up the business and technical KPIs. So of course we need our model to predict as accurate as possible, but there is also the business side of it. The stories need to be interesting, there shouldn't be many to be able to capture the directors and fans' attention, and they should be able to capture the right kind of races happening during the um, during the race. So basically, the right kind of battles. So we made sure that we not only predicted when a battle is going to happen, but also how difficult it is going to be given all of the historic data that came from the previous races and utilize that information to build probability curves and come up with you how difficult that overtake is so the fans can also see and appreciate the driver's effort to get ahead. And then finally, we used a higher level of services whenever we could to deliver the project as soon as possible uh, without spending too much time diving deep into the bits that is not needed, but spending that time into the modeling to be able to deliver the best predictions possible. So this is a very, 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 very,
because of it, I, I want to share with you this example. And then finally, I, after the call, I will leave you a link for the battle forecast example, where actually Daniel Ricardo will walk you through um, of what battle forecast looks like. But now I would like to show you the example of pit stop strategy so you can understand what is it that we build basically. All right. Wherever you look, there is action here in Bahrain tonight. TRS is very powerful up to turn four, isn't it? But uh, it has put a lot of cars side by side as well as. So here in pit strategy battle, you see how although one of the cars are going to the pit stop and he is going to change his tires, you can see how much time we predict that there, how much difference there is of. Um, overtaking so there's a 66 percent chance of hamilton overtake so let's see what happens overtaking and we'll have a look at hamilton's sector times because I, i'm pretty sure when ferrari pit vettel to cover that maybe they'll try and run him a bit longer but it's going to play now they had to cover off leclerc and hamilton and it's left vettel exposed vettel yeah. is coming in so 77 percent chance of an over and you see, it while you're watching the race, you see the probability of overtaking increasing. Take uh, Hamilton on Vettel, 81 percent now, because Hamilton's going faster. K1, to K4, push now, uh, two cars, push now. So this is the undercut. This so this is what an undercut basically. Ferrari is now pitting, and. We are trying to predict whether Hamilton is going to be able to go ahead and come ahead of once the Ferrari is out of the pit stop. It's Hamilton going faster on that new set of tyres than Vettel's able to because he's on an older set of tyres. Hamilton just coming round the final turn as the Ferrari pit crew execute a very nice pit stop indeed. Medium compound tyres going on to Sebastian Vettel's Ferrari. Lewis Hamilton goes past our commentary box and at a rate of knots. Vettel at 80 kilometres an hour. Hamilton. So basically this is um, this is the Ferrari car and this is Hamilton that is more likely to overtake. Has got the jump on Sebastian Vettel by performing the overcut, the undercut, and it's Hamilton now ahead. And then you basically saw that uh, Hamilton just overtook Vettel by leaving the, by the time Vettel managed to leave the pit stop, basically. The Ferrari. So this is an example of uh, the pit stop strategy. And after the call, I will leave you with the battle forecast example and there you have a more interesting speaker who will be walking you through the, uh, through the solution basically but uh, if you have any questions please let me know and uh, feel free to share any anything that you're curious about the project thank you now that was amazing no. yes then i think we will uh, p pursue to Ger Kola. thank you good luck so what I prepared, yeah, I hope to share just the window, but you see also part of my screen, but I guess, uh, I hope everybody can read it. Oops, let's move. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, thanks for, um, for giving the opportunity to present a bit of the, the things we do. And in a way, because this is a, a Saba store meeting, it's a bit of a, well, how do you say that in Dutch? Thuiswedstrijd, eh? you're playing uh, at your home field. Um, eh? So some of the things I'm going to say are perhaps familiar to some of the people, but uh, probably there are also people from outside, or uh, I hope to give you some new insights. Anyway, um, so um, I'm part of the analytics and optimization research group. As everybody who is over 30, of course, I didn't start in data science because data science well, we had 20 years ago, we had other ideas about what data science is, but uh, we converged to, let's say, integrating data science into our uh, daily work. And I want to give you a bit of the background of that and give you some examples and hopefully give you some new insights. Um, okay, first. Um, a little bit about Akba because that was also part of the question why I was invited to give this talk. So what are you doing? Um, 
ACBA uh, stands for the Amsterdam Center for Business Analytics. Yeah, and that is uh, a cooperation within the university between faculties working in the field of, of business analytic and data science. And I will, um, uh, so I think business analytics is more about uh, applying it, everything that goes with this, and, and data science is more uh, the science, well, what to do with the data. Yeah, and so business analytics is, is more applied, and therefore uh, we, we prefer to use uh, that term when we talk about um, the, the, the application. We have two main activities within uh, ACBA, eh? so it's mainly between the economic faculty and the faculty of science, and within science, uh, mostly mathematics and uh, AI. Um, we do research projects in cooperation with companies, um, and I'll give you a few examples of those uh, towards the end of my talk. And, I, and we have an executive program. So executive program means that these are people who have work experience, often uh, usually a very different background, um, and then they want to know more about uh, data science, and then they can follow. Of course, you can, for example, do an MBA at, the, at UVA. Uh, they have a big data MBA for which uh, uh, hey, we, we teach as well, but um, this program is one year part-time and really focused on, on business analytics and, and data science. Already the eighth or well perhaps this year, even the ninth year that we are having this group. Just a photo, um, this was also posted on LinkedIn, so there's nothing, uh, I, I think I can show it to you. So this is the group of last year, although it was COVID, we could have our final session um, um, uh, well, uh, physically, not online. So this was after handing out the di diplomas after and after all the presentations of the final uh, project. So what is so interesting about this group and what makes this this these people so valuable? And I think that's one of the main messages I want to uh, convey today. Um, so what is actually the promise of data science? Yes, and well, I guess I'm one of the few people in the audience with gray hair. I saw, by the way, looking at the people, there's one, a few people I know, of course, but there's especially one person that I cooperated with, Gerard, and he also has gray hair. So, um, and he's a historian, uh, he, he is into the history of, of, of science. So I hope he agrees with what I'm saying, but I think the promise of data science is uh, like uh, 100 years ago or 200 years ago, all we had was human, human experience. And then we learned to use statistics and do things in a scientific way. And, um, and we used randomized trials. So randomized trial is uh, very often used in medicine. So you have two different population, when you give medicine A, when you give medicine B, and then uh, after, uh, you have perhaps 100 people, and then you look at the outcome, and you randomize these. Uh, hey, sometimes they're, they're double blind, all kinds of technical stuff, very known to people in statistics. And what is happening now? We're moving to, we're towards retrospective studies. Yes. So prospective means that uh, you first go get the data. Uh, so as I explained, randomized trials, when you do marketing, uh, like Booking who is improving its website, hey, they do A B testing, they try to lay out of the page, does it work better or not? And then so they improve. Yeah. And what you typically need for that, relatively small amounts of data. Big effort because you have to do the test. Yes. Of course, when you can look back at data you already have, yes, hopefully, and that is the case nowadays, you have much more data. Yes. And um you don't have to get the data first uh, and wait until the right number of, of people is included in your test, so it's much faster, and you don't have to set up this or experiments. Once you have the data, you can do your analysis, so potentially it's much cheaper. And so that is what data science is doing. So we're moving from setting up these complicated tests to now we have a large database in which you try to include all the data we have, and then you can look into the data to answer your questions. And this data was gathered, well, not having this specific question in mind. Now you can use, uh, as long as there are enough attributes in the data, you can answer, hopefully, all kinds of different questions in this data. For example, uh, um, this is in Dutch. I, I looked it up, but I couldn't find something right away in English. But uh, it, 
some people, uh, there, there are, uh, if you have a high cholesterol level, uh, that has a high chance of cardiac problems, so you can take medication to decrease it. So there are different rules, like if your cholesterol level is higher than a certain level, yes, then you should take certain types of medication. Yeah, very simple, based on these randomized trials. Of course, with these type of things, there are lots of trials that have been done, but the outcome is relatively simple. Now, when you use data, and I recently came across this site, which is developed by Ortec in cooperation with cardiologists from Utrecht, then you see, and uh, really, you can make it personalized. You can enter your BMI, whether you are a smoker, what kind of medication you have, all kinds of other things. And then it gives you a very precise prediction. In this case, if you take a certain medication, it's in green, it's very small, you can't read it, but then you have 1.1 life years gained. Yes, and this is pretty severe medication. So then you can really talk to your doctor. Well, is it worth taking this, this medication? So it's, uh, and no more testing needed. This is just based on historic data of thousands of patients in Europe, in the US, uh, and you can actually even make that difference. So one of the main points, it's, it's the data, yes? And it's the data availability of data that makes this all possible, yes? And because you have this, if, if, you send, if you gather this data in some automated way, then potentially you have many more data points and hopefully you have many more attributes. And like in the example I just showed, you have attributes such as uh, your age and, and BMI, etc. Of course, if you want to include that in one of these randomized trials, if you want to make this, then you need many more people with all kinds of different BMIs. So that makes the test much, much better. Yeah, so we, and, and, and I think you saw that hey, you get more accurate and uh, if more if you have more and more attributes, you really get personalized uh, predictions. Of course, and this data is really the crucial thing. And the algorithms, of course, if you have these larger data sets that are larger in more data points and more attributes, then of course, yeah, you can use different algorithms. Yeah? So the algorithms, and the development algorithms, as I see it, follows more from the availability of the data. And it's the data that enables things. Of course, you also need fast computers. Yeah? So these are the flops, the floating point operations per second. We use to measure the speed of our algorithms by that. So that is also important. Yeah? So if you have more data, then you can tune an algorithm with more parameters without overfitting. Yes, so then it's logical that you move from the old-fashioned linear model from statistics to, to non-linear models. And, and like neural, uh, neural networks or all kinds of tree-based algorithms, they are, all, uh, they are non-linear uh, uh, compared to the uh, well-known old statistical linear models. Yes, so I think even if you think about that, then data science is the perfect word, yes, because it's about the data. However, in lots of our teaching, it is, it's very much about the algorithms. And our teaching should be more about the, the data and the added value of what we get from that, and less perhaps about the algorithms. Yeah. And um, then we come to uh, a, a relatively new term, which is data translator. Yeah. So like with many algorithms, uh, if you, uh, and if you, as being uh, uh, a majority um, Saba and, and Storm um, uh, members, uh, so you're still studying, then you learn a lot about algorithms. But in practice, there are may, way more people who use uh, these algorithms than design these algorithms. And then they have auto ML, and these algorithms get much, much smarter. You don't have to uh, find the high parameters yourself anymore. It's the algorithm that does it. Perhaps you don't have to choose the algorithm. Eh? You have some meta algorithm that chooses the algorithm that already exists. So, of course, you always need smart people who develop the algorithms, but this is a relatively small group, and most people will be users of the algorithm. But then again, these users get easier and easier and easier and less time consuming. What 
is still Curtius, and of course I cannot look into the future, perhaps that will also be automated at some point, but what is, uh, where's, yeah, where I think the demand will especially grow is in the area of so-called data translators. Yeah, and here this is copied from the McKinsey website and they wrote some article that was in Harvard Business Review. So this is all, man. They, 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 of course, try to make them hype themselves. But they say the analytics translator is the new must-have role. Yeah, so that is somebody who translates the findings from the data science, from the data into the value of the, of the company. Yeah, they, they, they are not the people who just execute the algorithms. No, they are the people who translate the output of the algorithm into the value for an organization. Yeah, so these are, um, uh, and here you see, of course, this is uh, a commercial firm that does these estimates, uh, so they have certain interest in it. On the other hand, it's, it's, um, it's published in a decent uh, business review, but they estimate use demands for these translators. And uh, going back to the beginning, these, um, um, and this uh, executive program in bots, uh, what we really try to do is educate these translators. And also in our business analytics program here at the VU, and we try to pay attention as well, not just only to the algorithms, but also to what you can do with it and how you should handle the data and what this data means. Yeah, so these are important things. Eh? You shouldn't just focus on the algorithms and the data science and certainly business analytics is much broader. And it's in the other things that eh, the added value is. Now, of course, the algorithm is crucial, but as I said, um, it is, uh, yeah, it's, well, it's taking less and less time and, and the algorithms themselves get smarter and smarter. So talking about the type of people you have, yeah, let's dive a bit deeper into that. Yeah, if, you, if you do a PhD yeah, or you write some internal thesis on a certain algorithm, then you're say I-shaped, yes? You're like, you have deep knowledge on one subject a certain type of algorithm, certain statistical te technique, something like that. So, you know how to use a hammer, but if somebody gives you a screw, well, the only thing you can do is, well, hit the screw, but it doesn't work, yes? Because you never learned how to use a screwdriver. Yeah? So, it's important that you also know how to use the screwdriver. So, then we call somebody T-shaped. Yeah, so there's a broad knowledge next to this deep knowledge in one subject. Yeah, but I told you about the importance of data. Yeah, so then you get somebody, well, I only have two hands, so I cannot show you anymore, but then you get somebody who is pie-shaped. And pie-shaped means that next to this deep knowledge in a certain, um, uh, in an, in a certain scientific algorithmic area, you also have knowledge in a certain domain. And like healthcare or marketing or, I don't know, uh, car production or um, hotel management systems. Uh, um, uh, if you look at uh, all the students we have, internships, all the research projects, uh, th this all happens in a certain domain and you can apply it to anything. Oh. And so this, but next to this, you can even go a step further, and that is the data translator. Perhaps this person does not have this deep knowledge into one area, it's perhaps not necessary, but this person also understands the value of the data, and it can talk to the business, and can translate the outcomes of the algorithms into added value for the company. Yeah, because they do not only need insight, eh, as it's often said in definitions of data science, no, they, eh, they want to, get a better product or make more revenue. Yeah. Okay, so this is uh, my main point about what the focus of, should be, of this should be. And next, I want to spend a couple of minutes and then I'm, I'm, I'm finished. I don't want to take too much of your time in such an online webinar. But let me give you a few examples on, on what you can do with it. And these are examples of our, uh, of uh, the things we uh, we do here at at, uh, at at business analytics and at uh, 
So my first example is an international courier service. Yeah, this was actually an internship product that I supervised a few years ago. So this student, of course, he had to collect the data first, interpret. So as always, he spends, of course, uh, as we all know, is written in any book on data mining. Uh, you spend most of your time on collecting data, understanding data, merging data, cleaning data, etc. Yes, unless everything is already there. And, and these projects also, they help organizations in, in structure their data. Yes, but still few organizations are so structured that you can, um, that the data is already there and there's nothing to be done about the data. Yeah. So here there was data of quotes and whether these quotes were accepted. Just an example, this is not a company. Huh? If you look at the colors at this small aircraft on the left, that's DHL, but this is not the company. Just an example, I just entered some data this morning. I want to ship something from Amsterdam to Paris and it's so many kilos, etc. Then I got this quote. Now, of course, I can click on this red button and then um, eh, pay for it, or I can go to the competition or, or not send it at all. Yeah? So this specific company had data on, eh, on these quotes and whether or not they were accepted. And if you think about it, okay, um, now you could make a prediction model, eh? you could train some machine learning model, that predicts the conversion probability, depending on all kinds of attributes, eh? well, well, destination, origin, destination, the size, uh, how fast it should go, et cetera, et cetera, all kinds of attributes. But one of the attributes is price. And if you have a good prediction model, then you can change the price, and then, eh, just like in old-fashioned uh, pricing, you can, you can kind of compute the elasticity, eh? if, you, if you ever heard about that. Not very important, the thing is, yeah, you expect in your prediction model that when you make the price higher and you have something like a logistic regression yeah, where you get a probability of acceptance that if you increase the price then well the probability yeah, that this type of customer yeah, will uh, will buy decreases and then you can look for the yeah, the expected value yes the probability times the price that you ask and then you can try to maximize that yeah so you can Maximize your revenue. These students did that, had lots of problems on the way, did lots of things. The organization was very happy. But to be honest, he was not very successful because there was very little variability in the historical prices. So and they always use strict prices, so it's very hard to train a good model. And so his model gave some counterintuitive things like you increase the price and also the uh, it was not always in the right direction, and so there were things. Um, and so this was not a perfect, and that is more often the case in data science projects. They, well, you always learn something from it, but they do not always uh, are successful. Two more examples. This is a successful model, although it's not already used. It was more like a research project. That's also a thing, and many organizations think they should do something with data. Yeah, but really turning it into value, that's that's a difficult thing. Yes, here it wouldn't be that difficult, but well, yeah, is, is the added value high enough? That's a bit of a question. So yeah, those, of know, those of you who, who know me are permit, know perhaps that I, well, uh, had, it was mentioned in the introduction, I founded the company in call centers, so I know a lot about how to plan and organize call centers. Um, and um, what is used in call centers to predict the service level is, is some kind of a queuing model. A call center, customers enter, there are a couple of servers called call center agents, and they serve the customers. And if all agents are busy, well, hey, you, you have, the, have had the experience yourself, then you enter a waiting one. Yeah? So that's a queuing model. So it is very hard to include, however, in such a queuing model, it's hard to include all features. Yeah, how do, when, when do people go on the break and how does this exactly work? Do, do they go on the break when there are no waiting customers or do they go on the break when they are so busy and, and when there are often customers? Yeah, Because of that, these queuing models, they have a systematic error yeah, in, in the statistical terms of bias. So you could also fit some statistical machine learning model 
do that and implicitly include all features. But to be able to do that, you really have to understand how these call centers work and all kinds of nonlinearities in the relation between number of, of employees and service level. Yeah. And that ended up to be way more accurate. Uh, and again, it's implicitly includable. So this is joint work with a, with a PhD student, external PhD student who is working uh, for this. Final project, and here you see uh, at, at some visit, I made a, a, a selfie, but um, and what you can see there is really impressive factory. Of course, Tata is a lot in the news for negative reasons, and I really hope that they will be able to, well, add to, to, to add, to continue to exist, but in in, in a both economically and, and environmentally viable way. So let's spend some of this European money on making Stata steel into a model factory that is, uh, 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 well, without any health hazard to people living there. Um, this here is a project uh, had financed by the EU, together with VU, Tata, uh, Inish, and, and, and different parties from the VU are involved, really such an APA project project let's I, I won't take too much time on it but ahead so this is a, a one of these projection line multiple production lines but here this, this what I'm talking about is about one of the production lines they made that full of sensors that measure temperature vibration uh, all kinds of things noise and so we have data of all that and we have also data about failure of, of certain components. And one of the critical components is like an engine that drives one of the rolls, they call the bridles. And uh, the steel goes around the rolls and there's a motor on it that kind of pushes the steel. And when the steel is, is under tension, yes, there is because of the resistance of the steel over this rubber, well, and the rubber coating around this roll and then they can, they can control the speed. Run. So when it fails, that rarely happens, luckily, but it's extremely costly. Yeah, and they typically, so that's hard to model because it's an extremely rare event. In a couple of months data, it only happens uh, well, once or twice. It typically happens when it's overheated. So what we do is we predict the temperature. And of course, that's a standard machine learning model. But then uh, going back to the business, what is very important, uh, there is a link to the production speed. Uh, in the previous example we saw, uh, acceptance is related to price here. A failure is related to production speed. Uh, so there, that's within the machine learning model. But they also I uh, want to link it to the production planning because in the end they well they want as little failures as possible, but they don't want to stop the or reduce the speed enormously because they have a schedule and they, uh, they they need to well they need to produce something and they was to want to use the machine as often as possible but uh, so there there are all kinds of links to the schedule and 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 what type of steel they have to produce and whether they are on a tight schedule or not etc et yeah so this whole relation and understanding that uh, that's part of the bigger picture for it to become interesting for uh, for that so that is also one of the things that doesn't stop with this machine learning model. There's much more to it. And then you really have to understand the, the full picture. Okay, let's let's wrap up. Um, um, so data is very important. And uh, so uh, if, if ever you are planning to use data science, do things in practice with the type of organizations I just mentioned, uh, perhaps if you are data scientists at, at Google, and uh, then you're perhaps just developing the algorithm. Uh, but in many companies that that uh, um, uh, that that uh, all these small, medium enterprise, also companies just as Tata, uh, they uh, it's for them it's not about algorithm development. It's for them it's getting the most out of the data and what is the added value for it. And it's important that you have, have a focus on that. I think there are two ways to um, to do that, and this is really my last point. Of course, you can start, let's say, if you're studying business analytics, and I think uh, some of you in the audience will definitely uh, do that right now. Um, and you start as a T-shaped person, 
And then it's very important that you learn about the DA, about the demand, perhaps already during your internship, and then about the added value of the business. And that's one of the things I always find extremely important about the internship, is that the student not only does the technical thing, but also translates it to added value. On the other hand, you could also start, eh, as you want, if you want to become such a translator, you can also start from business, yeah, and not being a data scientist, and then about learn about data science. Eh? You probably won't get the depth of this T-shaped data scientist, but you have a very strong knowledge about the domain. And as, as well, as you hopefully got from my talk, I think that's very important. So that's typically the type of people we educate in this uh, executive uh, program. Um, uh, but again, uh, conclusion is data is very important and added value for the business, yeah, because that is in the end and uh, whatever organization you're working for, that is what uh, drives you. Okay, that was the end of my uh, talk. So thanks for your attention, and I'm now open to questions. Hello, Ger. Thank you for your exciting talk. Um, and for everybody still being here on their uh, Tuesday afternoon. <laughs> um, yeah, so we have a Q&A for Ger as well. So, um, yeah, don't hesitate and take your time to think of a good question. Um, I would like to add that there are two ways to ask questions. So you could um, ask a question in the chat box and then we will be asking the questions. Or there is a new way, and we are also experimenting with this, um, that you could go to the blue button that says um, uh, add video and um, speaker, so that you can go onto the stage and ask your question live. So there are two ways. Um, I just wanted to add that. Um, so we will be having a look. And we have Derek again. Hi. Hi. Let's see. Again, I don't see any questions pop up. Not yet. Sometimes people need a little time to think. True. But it was very clear, Ger. Thank you so much. Everything worked well, so I'm glad. Let's see. And also, yeah, we do have, uh, after this, we have a button uh, with, uh, that says network and everybody can go there and you'll be automatically matched um, with a speaker. So that's also exciting and somewhere where you can ask your questions. Yeah, I think, I think we will go on uh, to the next speaker, but feel free to add your question um, in between presentations whenever um, you can just add Ger or add Nas and um, we will make sure the questions will be asked. Um, thank you Ger Kola for attending to the last speaker of today already. Um, and that will be uh, Lucy Leneau. And um, um, so welcome Lucy, exciting. Yes. Well, uh, thank you very much for having working me. Working correctly. Sorry. Is everything working correctly? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much for having me. Those were a very interesting presentation. It's a really yeah. well done webinar. Congratulations. Thank you. We are very excited. Um, I will let you speak then. So I work for a company called uh, Data IQ. And I'm going to give you a very brief overview of who is working at the, uh, with the Dataiku product and who we are and what we do. And then we're going to dive right in into a use case about uh, credit card fraud detection. So first, uh, what is the product that Dataiku uh, sells and what does it do? So it's called the Data Science Studio. And uh, essentially, Dataiku is a company that has been created in 2013 and has since grown in uh, customer and revenue. And uh, what it does is that it creates uh, an interactive data science platform that can be used by many different uh, people in the company and many different customers. Over the years, about every year, there is a new version of the product, the DSS, um, um, 
being elaborated with new features and uh, new tools that the data science world uh, uses uh, in order to do either modeling and machine learning or data analysis. Um, as you may know, data science is a field that uh, grows very fast and uh, the tools that we use changes almost every year. So it's very important that we keep up with what people are using in order to service uh, their needs best. And so if you uh, have some data that you want to analyze, what are you going to do when you use DSS? Well, you're going to be able to clean and wrangle your data, apply machine learning model, do some visualization, deploy your model into production, monitor and adjust your model. So these are all of the aspects of data science that you can do with DSS. So like it was mentioned in the talk before, and you probably heard that many times uh, also before, um, data science and uh, DSS, I mean, everything that you're going to use in order to analyze your data um, is a bit like industry agnostic, meaning that um, different sector will use the same tool to uh, monitor, analyze their data, and also put models into production depending what they want to do. And so therefore, um, there's really two sides of the data science world. There is uh, the side that's like the, the business uh, knowledge and uh, the data science side. So uh, whenever you graduate and you go on and you want to uh, learn more about data science, it's important that you pick an industry that you like because you're gonna learn as much about the industry and about what they do, as much as data science and modeling and everything. They kind of go hand in hand. So also, uh, as you know, data science is a field that's relatively new. Uh, data, uh, I mean, data IQ only exists uh, since uh, 2013. So um, everybody that we that were already working in the industry had to adapt and had to um, um, get familiar with a lot of different tools in order to do data science and data analysis. And so the people that you're going to see uh, collaborating um, on data science projects don't all have the same expertise and don't have the same level of technical expertise, which is really OK, because in the world of data science, you really need everybody's um, opinion and everybody's like uh, way of looking at things in order to make sense of a, of a data project. Um, like, for instance, uh, so those definitions that I'm giving here are really uh, I mean, the edges of those definitions are really blurry. If you've ever been on LinkedIn and look at a data scientist uh, uh, job posting, you're going to see that there is uh, as many definitions of what a data scientist does as there is uh, companies out there. So this is like mostly an example. And so those definitions may vary from company to company. But um, most of the time when you think about business analysis, you think about uh, more something like uh, visual preparation, uh, data analysis, like bringing a lot of um, uh, subject matter expertise. When you think of a data scientist, you think about someone that's more going to live in the world of notebooks, R, Python, and uh, that are going to produce models with those tools. Uh, when you think about, let's say, uh, everybody else in the company that doesn't have anything to do with data, but that has to use your data uh, in order to make decisions, they're going to mostly uh, worry about like what you have to say, the story that you're creating with your data, your visualization and everything. And when you're a data engineer, uh, you're mostly worried about your infrastructure um, and about, uh, around everything that has to go around, like uh, the data storage, how you, can you access it uh, smoothly? How can you uh, make sure that everything works well in the context of um, operationalization or uh, putting a model into production? I'm going to touch upon this a little bit uh, further down the line because uh, I feel like it's it's really a field that is exploding right now is uh, really data engineering and uh, and I, I will touch upon that a bit later. Uh, but for now, let's go to our use case of the day. Uh, so we're gonna uh, use uh, data from uh, a bank. It's a Brazilian bank called uh, Elo. And uh, we're gonna use data from 2017 to train a machine learning model. And uh, we are gonna make some prediction, prediction with uh, this data 
uh, on to data from 2018. So, uh, I mean, you've already probably seen it, but uh, just to give you a, a quick look at uh, what a data pipeline looks like. So you have a raw data that comes in. You're going to do some cleaning, some enrichment of your data uh, to make it more meaningful, more usable for your model. Then you're going to create a model. And then you're going to, um, with this model, do some predictions and then pass this model into production in order to make those predictions in real time, for instance, if this is what you need to be doing, and, uh, and have all of this pipeline uh, flow smoothly. One thing that's also very important is monitoring your data. Uh, so we're not going to touch upon this today, but, uh, but trust me, uh, there is a, a lot of ways that you can monitor your data using DSS. OK, so uh, here is what uh, Data IQ DSS looks like. So it's called the Data Science Studio. And this part of the studio is called the flow. So the idea is that uh, you can visually see everything that happens to your data. And you can interact with your data both by clicking on some uh, graphic user interface and also using codes and models if this is what you want to do. So every um, blue square is a data set. Like we can click on one for this one, for instance. Uh, so this is a, a table. It looks very much like a pandas data frame, if uh, some of you are familiar with it. And uh, so for each row, we have a credit card uh, transaction. And what we are trying to predict here is whether this uh, credit card transaction was uh, fraudulent or if it was OK. So here it's the data that's already labeled. And we have this column that's called the uh, authorized flag. And so if it's a one, it means that the transaction was uh, OK. And if it's a zero, it means that the transaction was fraudulent. And so um, we are going to predict this onto this data set from uh, 2018. So it's exactly the same as the one that I've showed you before. But it doesn't have any data inside of the column uh, authorized flag. So essentially, what we're doing first is that we are merging those two data sets. We are preparing them, so meaning we're cleaning them. We are uh, adding new columns to make sense of the data even more. Then we're splitting them again into labeled and unlabeled data. Uh, we are putting the labeled data inside of a model. And then we are doing some prediction over the data that's unlabeled. So I'm sorry, I'm not going to, I've already done this work because we have a short amount of time together. It would have been too much work to uh, make you go through the steps or going through the steps live myself. But uh, I'm going to try to make uh, the demo as interactive and as fun as possible to make sure that you don't fall asleep because uh, we are right after lunch. So I assume some of you might be tempted to do a, a little nap. But before that happens, let's dive right in. So here, I just wanted to show you how easy it is to uh, interact with your data uh, visually, because it's something that is a bit overlooked, I feel. And sometimes in the world of data science, you have a little bit of a snobbishness, like, oh, if you don't know how to code, uh, you cannot do real data analysis. No, no, it doesn't have anything to do with that. You can do real data analysis, even if you don't know how to code. So uh, here, for instance, I've done uh, several steps that I can show you. For instance, uh, the parsing of the date. So everybody, everybody who has done data science in Python know that parsing date is always a pain. But here, like we can do it uh, just with the visual interface. Like if we just click on parse date here, um, we can select the format that we want, and then we can extract uh, the the information from this date. So this is what I've done here. I've parsed this uh, column. So Here's the step that I've done. So I've part this column. And so now I have my date in the right format. And then I've extracted other information like year, months, and uh, everything. And also, uh, I've extracted an information that might be uh, interesting when we are talking about uh, enriching our data and uh, creating some new uh, features to make our model work better. This is a good example. Uh, what I've done here is that I've um, attributed a 
a number depending on what day of the week this purchase was made. So there are seven days in the week. So the number can be one, two, three, four, five, six, or seven, like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And so I've just created this column that might uh, be useful for my model in order to, uh, to analyze the data better. So that's one example of data enrichment that you can do, but you know, the sky is the limit. And once again, subject matter expertise is really important. Um, another thing that I've done, so in the data that I had at the beginning, uh, we had some data that was um, uh, latitude and longitude of where the purchase was made. So I've used a plugin. Um, essentially, like uh, this is also one thing that you can do is that you can add some plugins within your tool. And so with this plugin, I've computed what uh, state this purchase was made on. My was made in was made in. Uh, so there you go. So even if the bank that we're working with is Brazilian, all of the data that we have today is mostly from the US. So there you go. I have all of my uh, US data here. So here I'm back. So once again, like so the data pipeline, you read it from uh, left to right. So I'm here, I've started uh, cleaning my data. And so now uh, after this step, I have another data set that is a bit more clean and I'm going to apply another. Uh, so in, in DSS, there is there, like it has this own uh, vocabulary. It's called a, um, a recipe. So I'm gonna apply another recipe to it to add even more meaning to my data to make my model my machine learning model work even better. I'm going to add a Python recipe. So the one that I created is a super, super simple, but I mean, with Python, you can do anything you want. Uh, and you can even, if you like the notebook interface, you can even uh, have your uh, favorite notebook interface uh, in DSS. Uh, so I, so I've already, like I said, I already, uh, I've already done the work, so I'm not gonna redo it, but I can explain you what I've done. So here I've, I'm just like, these are, um, it's a data IQ uh, library that just allows me to load my data set into a pandas uh, data frame. And so if I run that, I can see my data um, inside of, uh, of this notebook. I'm sorry, my internet is very, very slow today. Okay, there you go. So I can see my data frame with everything that uh, I need. And then I've decided to compute a new column called uh, purchase weekend. And it's just gonna add a, a feature here at the end that is going to have a zero if the purchase was not made on the weekend. And it's gonna have a one if the purchase was made on the weekend. So uh, I'm taking the column that I've uh, showed you before so the purchase day of week, and I'm just doing a simple test to add a zero or one, um, whether it's in a weekend or not. Uh, this is not super beautiful Python, but it's efficient. And then I'm just uh, saving my data sets back into uh, my, my flow. So I can save it back into a recipe. And then if I go back to my flow, I'm here. And so now I can go inside of my machine, mo machine learning model and I can see uh, what we've done here. So here I've chose to use a random forest. I don't know if some of you are familiar with machine learning, but uh, essentially it's a, a type of machine learning algorithm. And uh, with it, uh, you can do many different things. Um, and I'm not where I want it to be, uh, but essentially uh, it's here, view origin. So essentially here, uh, I can tweak all of the parameters of the model exactly like uh, I would if I was in a, in a Python uh, notebook. I have all of my parameters, but instead of interacting with them in a programmatic way, I'm just interacting with them in a different, in a, sorry, in a visual way. So here DSS tells me that it's a two-way classification. Uh, is my, um, is my data uh, fraudulent or not? Yes, it's a classification. And here I see uh, the proportion that I have of uh, zeros and ones. 
in my uh, in my uh, target in my target and i see that i have only 10% of uh, fraudulent transaction which is a very good news for banks meaning that there is not a lot of uh, fraudulent transaction but it's a uh, very bad news for us because it means that our uh, data set is fairly uh, unbalanced and uh, so this is a problem uh, because if you have the most stupid model that you that you can imagine, which is a model that will always give you a one, always tells you that the transaction is okay. Well, according to this, it's going to be right 90% of the time. So it's not going to be a very good model and it's definitely not going to be good at uh, detecting fraud. So for that, I can go into a uh, weighting strategy and I can say, okay, uh, please use the class weights to rebalance uh, the, the data set. Uh, there is a, a ton of things that you can do to tweak your model uh, to your liking. Uh, what can I show you? Maybe feature handling. So we were talking about uh, subject matter expertise before. This is where like uh, subject matter expertise really comes into play. Um, here you can select and unselect the features that you want. And this is really where you need uh, someone who knows the domain well that is going to tell you, okay, I have an intuition that this feature is good or this feature is bad. Uh, let's say we were predicting uh, the prices of apartments. Well, uh, the square footage, for instance, would be something very important, but maybe something like uh, the year of construction of uh, the pipes uh, might not be super important to determine which is the price of the house. So essentially you would need like a, a subject matter expert, like in this case, for example, a banker, that would tell you, uh, okay, this uh, probably we don't care, this we do care a lot. And also, uh, just with your own intuition, you can see that uh, there's some features that are very redundant. For instance, latitude, longitude, location. These are three features that are uh, geographical. Probably if you keep only one, it's going to work as well. So there you go. And now, uh, so I don't have the best accuracy because it's a model that I've just done uh, super quickly. But uh, now let's explore uh, what's inside. Like if we look at our model, this is my favorite part of DSS because it really shows you how the model took its decision, which is super important and it's getting even more important these days with, uh, you know, there's a big emphasis on uh, AI ethics and uh, explainability of algorithms. So um, this is really important that uh, that we keep uh, our algorithms at checks to make sure that they don't have any bias, especially in people that are already uh, not, uh, not privileged in life. So um, one thing that you can see, for instance, is variable importance. Like what kind of variable is going to your, your model? What is What kind of uh, variable your model is going to use in order to make its decision? For instance, here you see that it's a signature provided. Well, this makes a lot of sense because uh, if, I, if I'm doing a fraudulent thing, if I'm uh, doing a, a counterfeit uh, purchase, I'm not going to sign the receipt. So probably the ones that have a signature are not uh, fraudulent. Same thing with the card age. It makes a lot of sense because um, you can imagine that someone that is going to commit a fraud is going probably to use a new card once and then throw it away. They're not going to keep their card for 10 years. So uh, that's probably a good feature to use, et cetera, et cetera. Same thing with purchase amounts. You probably, if you want to commit fraud, you probably want to buy something expensive, all of that. So you can really see, and this is going to also uh, give you a lot of intuition about how the model is taking its decision, what's important for it. And it's going to also, in terms of ethics, uh, it's going to be very important. Uh, let's say, uh, I don't know, uh, if you are doing some uh, cancer detection and uh, gender was a big thing that uh, that uh, was coming into play, well, sometimes it can be problematic. Sometimes it can be like, okay, but it just means that it performs better for men or women. And so therefore, like you need to uh, come back and like redo your, your analysis. Uh, one other place where you can see that even better is a subpopulation analysis. Okay, so I wanted to do that live, but it's already done for me. Uh, here, uh, subpopulation analysis, it is going to tell you if there is a subgroup 
in your data for which the model performs better. Uh, so here, for instance, uh, because we don't have gender or we don't have uh, a lot of information, but we do have uh, geography. So we do have the states in which uh, the, the, the credit card purchase is made. So we can see if there is a state for which it performs particularly well and the state for which it's uh, performing particularly bad. So here we see that it's uh, about the same. Like, I mean, there's no like 10% difference between one state from another, so it's probably okay. And maybe uh, we just have more uh, data about Texas because, uh, I know, for some reason, there is more uh, credit cards of this company in Texas. So um, this is how you can go look inside of your model and see what it does. Oh, I can show you one last thing very quickly. Uh, this is something that I really, really like as well. And this uh, can really help you also to uh, decipher how you want your model to perform. Um, so you know that a machine learning model, it, when it gives you a prediction, it doesn't, it's not going to spit out 0 or 1. It's going to spit out a probability, a probability of being 0 and a probability of being 1. And you can establish uh, a trade-off, uh, a thing of like, OK, um, I'm not going to consider this uh, an OK transaction, a non-fraudulent transaction, unless the prediction is like 0 0.9. Unless you're really, really sure it's not a fraud, you're going to classify this as a non-fraud. So this is going to be great for um, customers because uh, there is going to be because they're never going to be wrongly accused of making a fraud. But for banks, this is not going to be great because uh, uh, they're going to miss a lot of uh, fraudulent transactions. Same thing uh, on the other direction. Uh, if, you, if you're very strict with your fraud uh, threshold, then a lot of things are going to be uh, marked as uh, fraudulent. So it's going to be great for the banks uh, because they're not going to lose any money on fraud, but it's going to be very bad for the customer because there are, a lot of them are going to be uh, accused of uh, frauding when they're not. And maybe even in the long run, it's not even great for the banks because then they have to handle the problem and like reimburse the customer or whatever. So essentially, as your job as a data scientist is going to establish like all of that and talk to all of the subject matter experts to have uh, their opinion on what they're doing. Uh, OK, so to finish quickly, um, so I've talked about it a little bit, but this is a side that I thought it was interesting for you to know a little bit more about, because when you're in university, it's a side that you rarely see, and it's actually really important, because doing a model, very simple. Like, if you're here, you're uploading your data, and you're doing your little machine learning model and everything, you're, I mean, it's great, but your model is not going to do anything for you until it's put into production. Like until it's um, in, inside uh, an infrastructure that allows it, for instance, to make predictions uh, in real time. Uh, let's say you're uh, the bank that we're talking about. Well, I want to know if the if the transaction is fraudulent uh, right at the moment where the transaction happens. Like I don't want to to wait. So you imagine like with the amount of credit card transactions that are made every day. Uh, like you need a model that's extremely powerful because it needs to run every day. It needs to run uh, the thing. And more than a model, you need an infrastructure that works very, very well, like that is able to store the data, access the data, and uh, get your prediction really, really fast. So uh, this is where uh, a lot of the emphasis uh, lies. And so, Essentially, uh, so that's going to be my, my last slide. And when you look at uh, the pyramids of needs in data science, uh, it's yes, it's about. Uh, so the first thing is really about um, extracting the data, getting the data, but also storing the data. When you're a big company, this is a huge thing. Uh, storing the data, making sure that the data um, runs into your data pipeline smoothly, then explore, transform, transform it. Uh, clean it and everything, then making some analysis. Then the machine learning thing uh, comes really at the end. 
So, uh, yeah, essentially, <laughs> uh, it's always a, a good idea to have a little bit of an idea how the infrastructure, the architecture, and everything that goes before, that comes before machine learning works. It's gonna, in your career, it's gonna go a long way to, to have a little bit of, of uh, interest in those uh, aspects as well. Uh, so that's the end of my presentation. Hello. Thank you, Lucy, for the amazing talk. I really enjoyed that. And uh, I think the rest did as well. So thank you so yeah, much. And also uh, you, thank you for organizing today. It was a great and interesting day. Thank you. Thank you for working together. Um, enjoy your afternoon. Thank you, Derek. Thank you, Lucy. And uh, I will see you guys soon then. Thank you. Have a good one. Bye-bye.